Well, there are mounting global tensions between Iran and the West, as President Obama is trying to hit Iran where it hurts in the pocketbook. He signed an executive order today freezing all assets of the Iranian government and banks held in the United States. The White House says this is in response to what they call deceptive practices on the part of Iranian banks, but is also being seen by many as an attempt to further isolate Iran, as criticism against Iran's nuclear program continues to mount as well. Now, Iran, or Israel rather, is stepping up threats against Iran, and U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta has warned that Israel could attack Iran possibly within the next 90 days. President Obama says our goal is to resolve this diplomatically. But much of the rhetoric by high-ranking officials in several countries seems to point, to point to at least some preparation for the possibility of war. Now, I want to talk about the various aspects of this with the Director of International Studies at Trinity College, Vijay Prashad. Hey, Vijay, uh, I know that you have written that the Atlantic world has already waged war against Iran on three front fronts, economic, diplomatic, and covert. Talk a little bit about that history and the impact it may have on what's next. Well, the diplomatic one is very easy to explore because since the early 2000s, the United States has tried to create a diplomatic web around Iran. The centerpiece of that web was India. And India and Iran have a very long-standing relationship. And what the United States did was to promise India a nuclear deal. You, you'll uh, know that India is not a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. India in 1998 illegally exploded five nuclear devices. And yet, the United States went to India in the early 2000s and said, we will bring you out of the, uh, the nuclear sanctions cold, and we will provide for you access to nuclear material from the nuclear suppliers group if you vote against Iran in the 2005 meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And this is precisely what happened. A nuclear deal was struck with India. India came out of the nuclear cold. And even though it's not a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which Iran is, uh, India voted against Iran in the IAEA meetings twice on the side of the United States. So that was the diplomatic war that the United States has been conducting since the early 2000s. The covert war is rather striking because very few people are talking about the assassinations of Iranian scientists, four senior scientists killed in the last two and a half years. Most recently on January 11th, a 32-year-old nuclear physicist was, was killed on the streets of Tehran in broad daylight. Now, this is striking because the UN did release a very tepid statement. The non-aligned movement has released a statement condemning the assassination of scientists. But there's been no word from the Atlantic powers condemning this act of terrorism in the streets of Tehran. And according to my sources, scientists in Iran are now fearful of going outside, conducting the everyday business. After all, one of the scientists was shot sitting in his car, waiting to pick up his daughter from a daycare center. That means ordinary activities have become terrifying to scientists. This is a violation of the right to freedom of movement it's, of uh, intellectuals in, in Iran today. It's true, so Vijay. We've heard very little, too, um, you know, in terms of an investigation into that. Uh, and, and there's a lot of speculation about who might be um, behind that. Uh, I want to talk, too, though, uh, about just what we've seen very recently over the last few days these increased sanctions. Uh, I know we, we also saw a dispute between the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the inspectors, and the Ir Iranian government. Um, basically, those inspectors actually left the country after apparently not being allowed uh, to examine certain elements of the nuclear program. Um, and of course, we've also seen uh, you know, today the executive order signed by President Obama. Um, talk a little bit about these very recent events and what you think is most significant here. Well, there are two things. One is the economic sanctions. On December 31st, the Obama administration signed in a series of very tough economic sanctions, sanctioning the central bank, making it difficult for third-party countries to do trades with Iran. Uh, the European Union joined the United States with sanctions which are to come into effect on June 29th. The upshot of this has been that three countries, China, Turkey, and India, are very 
terrified because 45% of Iranian oil is bought by China, India, and Turkey. The Chinese and Indians have already promised the Iranians to circumvent the dollar and to pay for Iranian oil using either gold or a third-party currency, perhaps the rupee or perhaps the yuan. Currently, India uses Turkish banks, you know, to do its trades with Iran. There's a lot of pressure on the Turkish banks to not allow India to do these trades. There's a lot of pressure on these countries. So economically, the rial, the main currency in Iran, has lost its value by 70 percent. You know, it's a very dramatic thing for ordinary people. Conditions of life are not good. On the question of the nuclear debate between the IAEA inspectors and the Iranian government, if one looks broadly at questions of inspection, there is always a normal confrontation between IAEA or any foreign in, in investigators and a sovereign country. That is not something spectacular. One should not make too much of, a, of the fact that they are having a dispute. And we should mention, too, they, they are planning to uh, return uh, a little later this month, too. Uh, just kind of continuing this discussion, Vijay, on the money aspect of this, um, it's not just freezing Iran's assets here. From what I understand, um, this is the U.S. also sort of showing their willingness to punish other foreign financial institutions that do business with Iran. Uh, any dangers in this? Well, you know, remember, this is not a UN-authorized sanctions regime. So countries are not, therefore, un under any obligation to follow what are essentially European and American sanctions. You know, so there's no legal, uh, uh, you know, uh, punishment for India or, or China to so-called break the American sanctions. But what the United States is pressuring these countries on is if they continue to do trades with Iran, the United States will punish them for its trades with, say, India or its trades with China. The issue is the United States is not currently in a position to punish China. So this is a lot of smoke in the water, you know, that is being put out there. The Chinese are, are playing this very close to their chest. They have been meeting the Indians. They've been discussing things with the Turks to see if they can create so-called exemptions to the American sanctions. So one should not come to this question of sanctions believing that the United States here is the biggest dog at the table. All right. And, and finally, we just have a little bit of time left. Um, but I've got to say, you know, there, you turn on any station and there's a discussion about Iran. And um, there are some people who say that war with Iran is not only imminent, that it's actually a good idea. You know, critics of the critics say Iran doesn't have that much conventional military capability and wouldn't be able to retaliate other than with their oil. Um, so might as well uh, strike them. Uh, what's your response to, to this sort of way of thinking? There are 78 million people that live in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I'm afraid there is a very cavalier sentiment in the world where people talk about things like, we're not going to attack you now. You know, as if uh, there is a sort of God view available to certain people about the killing of others. When 78 million people are held hostage like this, I find it unforgivable. It's a very uncivilized way to approach questions of diplomacy and international relations. I have no respect for people who talk so, you know, simply and easily about uh, killing other people. I think that they have lost control of their own rationality. I think that's a really good point. Uh, unfortunately, in this era of 24-hour uh, cable networks, a lot of times what you just hear is those 10-second sound bites, a lot of them sort of fear-mongering, and that's what's being put out there right now. Always appreciate your insight. Vijay Prashad, Director of International Studies at Trinity College. Thank you.